Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are. This is the third of the talks on impermanence in the overall series about the four ways of changing the mind. In the second talk, the last one, we looked at the outer impermanence, outer in the sense of all those things which are not ourself, the outer universe and the people in our lives. And we're going to go on to consider the inner impermanence, which is about our own impermanence, and that means our own mortality, our death about death. And the idea was that this third talk would be about the classical reflections concerning death. But in the meantime, I've been thinking, and I thought to make first a short video, this video, highlighting two points about death. The first one is mainly there because of what seems to me to be somewhat of a misunderstanding in the way uh, people, and including myself for many years, think of reincarnation, because reincarnation is such a central part of the Buddhist teachings and what we study and what we believe in as Buddhists. I think many people have the idea of carrying on, of coming back, and it's not quite like that. When you die, as I mentioned in the previous talks, this story which is your life, everything you are, which is so much defined by the people you know, your family, life around you, and defined by the world in which you live and how you've interacted with it, what you've contributed to it, what you've become in the fabric of society. All of that long story comes to its end and the personality that you've become in that story finishes and that person and that will go for good forever, never to be seen again. It's not as though you'll come back. Something will carry on and make a new life. but not you. Too much happens. So, in order to find the truth of the matter, we need to think a lot, study a lot, meditate a lot. I think the real feeling of what actually happens may take a very long time to really grasp. But I do think it's useful that we get rid of the idea of somehow a sort of me coming back. Because you know very well, the Buddha's teachings show us that there is no lasting me. There is no core personality, a soul, an Atman, that will carry on from life to life. To try and get the feel of it, I thought to give you the idea of a, a sort of a sliding scale. On the one end of the scale, so incorrect, you have the idea of, I'm coming back. A bit like in some of these fantasy films where you have, would be like Ken 1, The Return of Ken, Ken 3, yet again Ken, Ken comes back 4, and so on. The idea that somehow you will continue from life to life. So as I just mentioned, it doesn't work like that. When you die, you finish. And it's even the same with the very great Lamas. When we look at the lives of the Kamapas and so on. From one Kamapa to the next. Although that core enlightenment 
the Chimrezic presence and so on is there. The actual, what we will call personality, activity, radiance of the Kamapa is new. It's different, as many of us have seen now with the transition from the 16th to the 17th Kamapa. The magnificence, the unique Kamapaness is there somehow. But the personality and the mode of activity is significantly different from the previous one. And it will definitely be the case with us. Whatever carries on, we won't come back. So that's one end of the scale. On the other end of this imaginary scale, then let's take the idea that some people have about dying and being buried. Then they think, well, although life is finished, my body will become part of the earth and I'll carry on living in the grass and the flowers and the trees around the place where my body is put into the ground. So there, on the other end of the scale, you have Dispersal. Whatever was there before just gets scattered and dispersed into nature. Just like the body goes into atoms which are integrated into all the other plants and the soil itself. On that end of the scale there's too much dispersal forever. On this end of the scale there's too solid an idea of me coming back. So we study karma, cause and effect. We study the fact that we are, in fact, tens of thousands of overlapping karmas. We try to understand that the influence of those karmas in the stream of consciousness, which goes on from one life to the next, will shape the new person. But it will be a new person not you coming back. The story, in a way, carries on, but it really is a brand new chapter. There is something which is unique and discreet, and we consider all of this when we come to the teachings on karma, so we won't go into it too much today. But it's just to say that as Buddhists, the idea of reincarnation is not the idea of this sort of continuity of story that we have from day to day, year to year, decade to decade, that we thought about last time, it's not as though that story carries on. There is a huge dispersal of its components at death, and when they do reformulate into a new life, it is quite new, a new existence. So that's one point I wanted to make about death. And in that context, then, uh, we need really to understand, before we can understand death, we need to understand, well, what is life? Unfortunately, one of the best, magnificent teachings we have in Buddhism is part of the secret teachings, usually only available to retreaters. It comes from the third Jawa Kamapa, Rangjung Doje, and it's called The Profound Inner Meaning, the text. And in there we get a wonderful description of how consciousness links up with the sperm and the ovum of the future parents, how from that moment on a life begins, how body and mind interact, how the various energies and channels and chakras and all of those things are formed, and how that carries on until the moment of death. And then what happens at death when that complex story finishes? We can only really understand what happens at death, death when we understand life. And in particular, how in what we call life, body and mind interdepend from the moment of conception to the moment of physical death. It's not even as though body and mind are two 
different things that influence each other, although from a rough point of view we can certainly see it acting like that. They're even more intimately mixed than that. We just separate out what happens into our ideas of body and mind. But they are very, very much linked. Which is why if we damage our brain, then our consciousness is damaged. Or it works very differently afterwards. Not only our body, but the physical universe around us affects our mind. It's only by profound, amazing reflection on what life is that we can understand what death is. Now, that brings me really on to the second main point that I wanted to make, which is about ultimate and relative truth. You've probably seen many of these profound quotations from the great masters, either in the past or contemporary ones, which say, nothing dies. In ultimate truth, of course, it's the case, and we touched on this last time, in the second of the talks about impermanence, because we saw that for there to be change, impermanence, there has to be something that changes. And when we try to pin down something, it's impossible. It's impossible. We can never grasp it or find it. And we see that what changes is not reality, because reality doesn't exist in a fixed way. It's constant can't even say change or flux because there's nothing there that changes. It's amazing. What changes is not reality, it's our idea of reality. So we tend to freeze reality using names and concepts. And then we say, ah, when we think about it again, we have a new image, picture, and that's not the same as before we say, ah, it's changed. Now, without getting too complicated or abstract, let's take a very simple example. If you think of a child, and I'm sure many of you are parents and you've had children, you have children. From one to five years old, all those years of formation, that child is very, very different from the child from five to ten years old. Isn't it? And that's very different again from 10 to 15. And then in the late teens, all that growing up and becoming an adult from 15 to 20. But from the outside, other people give that child a name, Bill, Mary, whatever it is. And for them, it's somebody. But which one is it? Is it the one to five year old? the five to 10 year old, the 10 to 15 year old, which one is the real one? Of course, there isn't. And then when we go within those five year periods, it changes from year to year. Person changes, develops from month to month, from day to day. So very often we don't see somebody else's child for three years. We come back and say, gosh, how you have changed because we have our own image from before and our image now and we put the two together. The way they existed for us in the first place, the way they exist for us in the second place, there's change, that's very reasonable. But when we look not at our relative impressions, but what's really happening out there, if we speak roughly, there is constant change, but for the absolute truth, when you try to find anything that exists, you can't. You can't even say, ah, that was like that, and now it's changed. Because every second is different, and in those split seconds you can't grasp it, it's already become something else. A human being, 
life, nature, everything is all the time in movement. So from that absolute point of view, there is no death. There is no death. Because for there to be death, which is the end of existence, then there would need to be something or somebody that truly existed. But that is the topic of voidness, of shunyata. And um, when we think about impermanence, we only just know about that by the way. The main thing deals with the very real world in which we're involved. You remember last time, the world to which we cling, to which we're attached, where we have hopes and fears. And that world does very much seem to us to change. And in that world, one of the main things are people and their lives, and ourselves and our life. So when we think about death, when we, in the next talks, we come to think about death, I thought it was useful in this idea of death and reincarnation to have these first thoughts about what is life and what is reincarnation. Just to finish, there's a very, very famous quotation of the Buddha. It comes from a text called the Udana Varga, and in there he says that very well-known set of four sayings, all that is gathered will be dispersed. All that is built up will collapse. The end of all meeting is parting. And the end of life is death. Now, of course, those things are universally true, and that is why that saying is so much associated with the Buddha's teachings on impermanence. It's interesting to note that when he gave that teaching in a town called Shravasti, not only was he giving a general teaching, but everyone knew he was talking about four very well-known rich merchants who'd had vivid, famous stories one of them had gathered and hoarded many beautiful objects. He was famous for his jewels and unique works of art that he'd bought and that he lost. All of them, the things he had, became dispersed in the four directions. The second was a merchant who was very wealthy and he loved building homes. He had a home for the summer a home in the hills where when it's hot you can go for the cool, a home for the spring, a home for the autumn. All of his houses were seized by the king and destroyed, burnt down. So all those beautiful places that had been built up collapsed. A third merchant had spent, he liked people, so he'd spent his money having parties, traveling to go and meet the people he wanted to meet in his life. And the end of all of those meetings is, of course, parting. Whether we're with somebody for two minutes, two hours, two days, or 20 years, we come into each other's lives, we are together in shared karma, shared realities, and then goes away. And then, fourthly, the end of all life is death. So of the four, and the reason he said that, by the way, was because the fourth merchant spent his money on very expensive, long-life elixirs from rishis and sages, on rare plants and so on that would make him live longer. But like everybody, he died. Nobody lives forever. So that's the reference that the Buddha was making when he gave that particular teaching and that people had in their minds. But of the four, that fourth one, the end of life is death, is the hardest of the four to understand because to understand death 
then we need to understand what life is. Thank you. That's, that's it for today. It's really just like some footnotes in this series of talks that I felt I wanted to add. Please uh, live happily. Enjoy today in this changing story of life. And I hope to have the honor, pleasure of speaking with you very, very soon. Bye-bye.